Welcome everyone. Uh, today we're going to talk about how to start out in fun marathon matches. And your hosts are me, Dmitry Kaminetsky, better known as Dimka Dimon, and Aaron. Aaron yeah, Kirchner. Aaron Kirchner, better known as Kafan Aaron. Great. So let's begin. Okay, so today's agenda. We'll talk about what are fun marathon matches, why why should you compete in them, and more importantly, how do you compete in them? So first of all, you need to dissect the problem statement, work out how to use the local tester, work out the submission process, and then we'll tell you about how the scoring works and how to behave on forums. And finally, we'll talk we'll briefly talk about some uh, marathon techniques that are useful and we'll give you a coding example. So we've got a practice problem uh, called the snake charmer that you can actually try it out yourself and so we'll, we'll show you a coding example of that. So who are we? I'm Dimitri. I uh, started Top Coder quite a long time ago in 2002 and just been loving it the whole time. Um, originally I was doing algorithms for a long time but then it kind of got a little bit too hard for me so I moved into marathon matches in 2011. Um, actually Psycho recommended that I do this and yeah and I've been really enjoying marathon matches so much that I started writing problems last year. Aaron? Yep, and I am Aaron Kirchner. I've been a member of Top Code for a decade and a half and a little bit more than that now. Uh, back in my earlier days, I competed in Algo and started writing Algo problems a lot. Uh, once marathon problems kind of became a thing, um, it wasn't long before almost every marathon problem we were doing was written or tested by me for a period of several years. Um, enough so that I, I actually just thought it would be easier to become an admin to help kind of set things up, run them. And sure enough, there's been plenty of administrative work to do for running all sorts of contests uh, ever since then. Uh, so since about 2008, I've been with Top Twitter either as a contractor or as a full-time employee. Uh, that's changed a few times, uh, depending on the circumstances. Uh, let's see. Fun little fact related to marathons. Uh, back when the marathon match idea was first proposed, there was sort of an informal contest to come up with a name for them. And if you did not already guess where this is going, guess who came up with the name marathon match? That'd be me. Um, so yeah, there's my, my little shameless plug for, for myself at the moment. And yeah, so uh, in the time I've been here, I have been to 11 TCOs. You've probably seen me if you've been to the TCO. Um, if you have competed in algo or marathon, there's a very good chance I've been involved with many of the problems you've seen uh, or have been running the test. Uh, other than that, yeah, I, this has just kind of been kind of, kind of my second home for quite a while. Well, thank you, Erin. You've done quite a lot there. We couldn't have this without you. So thank you for all your hard work. And my condolences. Okay, so what are fun marathon matches? It's a programming contest, as you've probably guessed, and it goes for seven days. Actually, we used to have ones that go for for even longer, like two two weeks, but uh, probably that was a bit too long and people were starting to get tired. So these days, it's just seven days. Uh, we try to run them as regularly as possible, so about once a month. The problem types can be pretty much anything ranging from abstract to games. So that could be video games or even board games. There's usually some aspect of an optimization built into the problem. Um, you can have problems based on compression, all sorts of things. So they're pretty random. But the key ingredient is there's no known or tractable optimal solution. So you might be able to solve a particular case or a particular sub-problem, but in general you, you won't be able to solve all, all the cases, or especially given that we only have 10 seconds, we, 
for each case, and that makes it pretty challenging. Um, the scoring we use is relative scoring, so that means that the score you get on a case is compared to the best score achieved by anyone on that case, and you get some percentage of that. So Erin will talk more about that. And then in terms of the submissions, you submit your your code in a zip file, and that's run on the server, um, and it's it's you you're provided with example results. So there's 10 examples and you get to see the, the actual cases and, and your output for each case. We also have 100 provisional cases and you don't get to see them. You only get the final score for those 100 cases. And once the competition is over, we do a big run of about 2,000 or more cases. And then that's what decides your final standing in the, on the leaderboard. So you can have, you can use Java, C++, C hash, or Python. We used to have Visual Basic, but um, not anymore. Might bring it back later. Okay, so let's have a look at some example problems just to give you an idea. So this is jump around from last year's TCO round three qualification. So you have a grid and you have some walls that are shown in grey and then you have these pegs so they're blue circles and you have to move the pegs into their target locations which are shown in green and the way to do that is a peg can jump into a neighbouring empty location so the jumps are just left, right, up or down but they can also jump over other pegs or over walls and this way you can you can reach your target faster. And so your final score is actually the number of moves that you took to place all the pegs in onto green target cells. And of course, if you did manage to do this, then um, you will be penalized. So obviously you want to minimize this score. So another problem we had is from last year's final, it's called multiplayer chess pieces. Again, you have a, a square grid and you have some walls on the grid. Um, you have multiple players, so you, you're controlling multiple players and each player can place a number of different chess pieces. And the, the key constraint is players cannot attack pieces from other players. They can attack their own pieces, but not from other players. And of course, the walls get in the way, so a piece cannot attack through a wall. So the idea here is you want to place as many of these chess pieces, and each piece gives you a, a fixed number of points. So the more you place, the, the more points you get, which is better. And some pieces score more points because they're harder to place, like a queen or rook, and other pieces score less points. So, yeah, so this is an example solution. And, and the competitors did quite well in this problem and they, they found some really interesting solutions. So you can read about that later. And finally, and this is probably one of my favorite problems that I've written, this is a recent problem called rotating numbers in marathon match 117. You have a grid of numbers which range from one to n squared and you have to place the numbers in order, in consecutive order. So the first row has to be one, two, three, four, and then five, six, seven, eight. What you're allowed to do is to pick a square subgrid and you can rotate it clockwise or counterclockwise. And depending on the size of this subgrid, you incur a penalty. And so the, the, the larger the subgrid, obviously the more numbers you can move in one go, so the higher the penalty. And yeah, so if, if you get all the numbers in the right, order, then you don't incur this penalty. 
Ah, sorry. So there's a penalty. There's also another penalty if you haven't got the numbers in the right order. So you, you want to avoid that as much as possible. Okay, so why should you compete? Well, like anything worth doing in life, you learn new skills and techniques, which is great. But for me, it, it's probably the, probably the most interesting part is making new friends from around the world and just meeting some really talented people and learning from them. Plus, you also get the chance to compare yourself against these people and sort of, you know, see how good you are and get better. Um, and then the idea with these competitions is you kind of, you learn how to do research or scientific research because you run, you run a bunch of experiments and then you see how well your, um, your algorithm performs and then you learn from that and that, and then you try a new algorithm and see if you can improve your solution. So it's a, it's a very iterative process and it involves, you know, recording your results and then optimizing your solutions, just like in real research. Plus, we provide you with some cool visualizers, so it's really fun solving these problems. And if you become really good, then you can become the TCO champion and, yeah, win the competition. So that's something to aim for. Okay, so I'll, I'll pass it on to Erin now to talk about this section. All right, excellent. Thanks, Dimitri. So you're talking about switching from SRM Diago competitions to Maryland. Why would you want to do this? So obviously it's a chance to try something a little bit different uh, using new techniques. It, of course, in the algorithm matches, you're talking about problems that more or less have one kind of solution output you're expected to get. And if you don't have that correct output, then your solution is wrong. There's a few exceptions to this for some problems that have custom checkers. But in general, that's how algorithm works. Uh, you're doing a very short contest, and it's kind of pass or fail. So the techniques in a contest uh, that's longer in nature, that's a little bit more flexible, gives you multiple chances to submit, it's going to be a different area. You're also going to be using some other kinds of algorithms, where it's not just not just looking for a known solution, but with where the solution is unknown, there's a lot of kind of blue sky for you to try different things, and that's encouraged. There's a little bit less emphasis on the speed. You're not judged based on how quickly you come up with a solution. You could be working on it all week, and after seven full days of no sleep and a lot of coffee, um, there are developers who do things frighteningly close to this, that would be just the same score for that kind of solution as if you would only work on it for an hour instead of immediately. So how quickly you come up with is not the most important thing. Obviously, working efficiently is good so that you can make the most of your time working on it. Nonetheless, it's not, not a race. Unlike algorithm where, of course, getting your submission in first and maximizing the points matters here, the score has very little to do with that, usually nothing to do with that. You've also got a lot of time to compete. Where a contest goes for typically seven days, Can I come a little closer to the mic? So the microphone is actually on my earpiece, so there's not a whole heck of a lot I can do with that. I can try to adjust a bit, though, so that hopefully the sound comes through a little bit better. There's only only so much I can do with that, as best I can, though. Uh, yeah, so there is more time to compete. When you've got a full, a full week to work on a competition, you can work in the mornings if that's best for you. You can work in the evenings if you like that. You can work three days in a row and then take a day off. You can work all seven days. You can wait until the last day and then just see what you can do in one day. It's all at your own leisure, what, what times you work best, and when you really want to do it, when you feel you're most productive. That makes it a lot more relaxed. You don't have to worry about what time does the contest start, uh, what time. You do have to worry about your time zone a little bit, obviously, to know when the beginning and the ending of it are. Other than that, when it's convenient for you, you can be there. And of course, the iterative solving. You can submit as many different times as you want, continually making your solution better each time. Ideally, I should say, making your solution better each time. It's entirely possible to submit something that is not as good as what you had before. And it's important to be aware of that and you know, be ready to revert back to changes that don't work. Uh, it's actually really nice if you're not sure 
how to approach something. I know from the few times that I have actually competed on marathons in days way gone by, typically the first pass will be something kind of something kind of basic, maybe even random, just good enough to get an answer that works. And we see how it scores. Then as I get into it, start to think about little things that maybe could work a little bit better. And so that gives you a chance to make small improvements. Being able to see that progress, at least for me, I have found is a good motivator. That uh, tells you that you're, you're doing well and things are things are coming along. Good encouragement to keep, keep going when you know you're doing well. So as for how to switch, you spend that time, you think about how to solve a problem well, how to get a good answer for it. Not necessarily an optimal solution, because in a lot of cases, as Dimitri said earlier, there really is no one single optimal solution. Um, it, sometimes for small cases, yeah, it might be possible to solve it perfectly. Generally speaking, though, if we have built the problem correctly, it's nearly impossible to find that, especially for the larger case. And remember, it is a marathon. It's not a sprint. So you got to pace yourself. Spend a few hours working on it when you're motivated. If you start to get too tired or running out of ideas, go do something else. Watch some TV. Play, play some video games. Make a meal. Go say hi to your kids if you remember their names still after you've been doing this for a few days. Just do other things with yourself for a little bit and come back to it. Relax, try to have fun with it. Can we get the next slide? Excellent, so how do you compete? Step one is to register. This is just like registering for any other um, development or design kind of competition on Top Coder. It used to be a different kind of part of the site. It is now kind of integrated into the rest of the site. You register, you're going to read the problem statement. The problem statement is going to have many different sections in it telling you all sorts of different things that you're going to need to know about what the problem is asking, your output should look like, how the test cases are generated, things like this, all the kind of stuff you're going to want to really digest and understand in order to do effectively on your solution. You're going to want to download the local tester and example submissions. The local tester is kind of usually a visualizer and it gives you uh, some code. It's a, it's a Java, little Java program that you can run. It will actually run against your code and show you visually what your, co what your code's output is actually doing in terms of the problem. Example submissions are very, very basic dummy submissions that just have basically the minimal, the minimal structure necessary in each programming language to get an output that is valid for the problem. Not necessarily going to be anywhere near optimal, even going to be good. Uh, usually it's going to be pretty terrible. However, it gives you something to get started with to verify that your inputs and outputs look the way that they should, that kind of thing. It's at least something. As you iterate and have better solution code, you compile and test your solution, and then you submit it. And then you try to modify it. Try something different, try to come up with something better, and go back to number four. You compile and test it, do the whole thing again. You keep doing that, Track of how you're doing each time, see which improvements are actually better. And ideally, by the end of it, you've got the best thing you can possibly come up with. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's talk about the problem statement a bit. Problem statements in marathon problems tend to be fairly lengthy because there is a lot of information that's covered. The problem description is simply what is the problem asking. What this means is uh, it's going to be kind of tell you the story behind the problem, if there is one. As you know, a lot of top coder problems have a um, slightly contrived story. Uh, if you're familiar with algorithm, a lot of that same concept applies here, and where it might start out as, you know, some people playing a game, or here's a grid that represents whatever, here's something that represents a map, uh, here's input that represents people uh, that are doing different things, and you're going to assign them tasks. Whatever it might be for the problem, that's what the problem description is going to tell you. It's going to give you the idea of what it is you're trying to solve. The input and output is going to describe exactly what the input and output looks like. The way the input and output is passed between your solution and the tester is your solution is actually going to read from standard. It's going to read various lines of input, which it's going to you know, load into whatever data structures you really want to use. It's kind of a standard way where it's going to be much like what you're familiar with, with various different arrays or integers, strings, uh, floating point values, that kind of thing. And then the output is going to be the way you're expected to output it, which you're just going to spit it out to standard out. And then the tester is going to, tester is going to absorb that output from standard out and calculate your score based on it. Test case generation. So this is going to give you information about how the different test cases can be generated that your code will be run against. 
So typically that means the limits on the parameters, uh, minimum and maximum values, possibly if there's something other than just a standum, standard random distribution, if there's some sort of special distribution, maybe a Gaussian distribution for some of the parameters, these kind of things. Everything about test case generation is going to tell you a lot about what the constraints of the problem look like and what the actual test cases might look like. Uh, a frequent note I'll mention there, in some cases, if the actual test cases are expected to be quite large, sometimes we will manually fudge it so that the first maybe two or three cases are artificially made to be smaller than they normally would be. Those are only for the examples. You're not actually scored against them in submission. Uh, the purpose of that, however, is that while you're getting started, especially gives you just very small, easy to see test cases that you can look at and that you can you know, kind of test against quickly and be able to see and understand everything that's going on without having to worry about solving more complicated or larger cases. Note is going to think about how many test cases there are uh, and the number. And um, yeah, for provisional and final tests, typically it's going to be 100, 100 provisional tests is usually what we go with. Final test is going to be 1,000 or 2,000 usually. We do adjust that a little bit based upon how close we expect scores to be in a given problem or you know, how long we think it's going to take to run each test case so we know how much time it's going to take to run all the tests. Things like this can sometimes play into it. But there's also going to be some information about timing. How long do you have for your solution to generate its output? Uh, because while marathons are not necessarily based upon based upon um, the, the time that you run, there does have to be a limit, both from a practical standpoint to be able to actually test these things in some reasonable amount of time, and also because when you're talking about long, complicated, difficult problems, if you have an unlimited amount of time, of course, you can come up with much better solutions. So kind of curtailing the amount of time does matter. I do see there is a question coming in, which I'll get to when I get to the end of this slide. There's going to be a section for the downloadable files, which is going to be the, the tester that we talked about, which is going to be kind of your visualizer and your offline tester that you can use, as well as the example solutions, which again are kind of the very minimal sub-solutions that, uh, that you would look at. And then the local tester is going to tell you a little bit about any options that might be available for the local tester and the basic instructions for how you're going to use that, how you're going to execute that from the command line and tell it where to find your solution to run again. In some cases, the local tester may include options for, <clears throat> pardon me, may include specific options for manually setting certain parameters or in, in some cases where the problem is a game of sorts. The, um, the, the tester may allow you to do manual play, where instead of relying upon your program to generate the next move, you actually, as a person, can play the game. Uh, in some, some cases, that's kind of fun just to get a sense for how the, for how the problem works and what's being asked. And it's, it can also just be a fun little pastime to mess around with, too. So just to, addressing the problem that came in, are the problems sorted by difficulty? So short answer is no, they are not. Um, and, and the longer answer is difficult according to whom. Um, there, there's a lot of problems that might be very, very difficult to find an optimal solution for. Ideally, almost all, if not all, of the marathon problems. It's difficult to impossible to come up with a perfect solution. Um, in terms in terms of difficulty, a lot of times it's, we don't really know. We know it's going to be hard to find an optimal solution. We usually try to come up with something that is possible to get a solution without too much trouble. Some problems that may be a little bit easier or harder initially to come up with something that works. Um, other problems, there may be various known strategies, known, um, known algorithmic approaches that you can get started with. Others there may not be that we're aware of. So it's really hard to even guesstimate uh, what difficulty would be. And as we'll get to when we talk a little bit more about scoring, it's not just based upon how you do against the problem, it's how you do compared to everybody else. So sense of difficulty is necessarily a concept that has to apply here, uh, which is why there, it would be senseless to even try to come up with a good sorting based on difficulty. Of course, you can look at comments that people have made in the forum for various different problems, things like this, to get a sense of if people found something to be more challenging or less challenging than others. Again, though, it is largely a matter of personal taste. Some folks just happen to get lucky and see a problem and know a method that they did something recently with that maybe you could apply here. Or uh, back in the day, we had a problem that was based around Sudoku, and we had some members who had written their own Sudoku solvers in days gone. So things like this sometimes sometimes can allow uh, a, a bit of an advantage. We obviously try not to make anything that's a totally known published problem, 
because that would be really boring for everyone. Uh, nonetheless, obviously, de depending on what other experiences you can apply to it, there's always a chance you might get lucky, or you might just see something that jumps out at you right away. I see another another question, so I'll answer that before I go to the next slide also. Um, are there editorials after the contest is over? Unlike albums, typically there are not, uh, because the interesting parts of the problem are not just in how to find the solutions. What did you think of the problem? How did you go about it? So what you will find after a contest is forum discussions. A lot of members will start asking, hey, here's what I did. What did what did the rest of you do? Did, did anybody come up with something better than this for the third example? Here's the best one I could find. Did you find a better way to do it? And that's really where you that's where you get a lot of the uh, a lot of the discussion and really what's probably a lot more valuable than any kind of an editorial that we would write up for it. And that's also a great learning resource. Uh, I think that's probably, in, unless you're actively continually winning these kind of things, it's probably one of the most fun things for a lot of members to do is to really go there and discuss after and yeah, just, just see what people did. You can learn from that. And, and as, yes, I believe that was Harsh had probably said, there is a poster approach forum thread. That, that's kind of the name that we've had ever since the very early days of Marathon. Uh, that was member uh, JD actually came up with that. And for a while, we sort of insisted he had to be the one to post that post. And as for people to say post your approach, others have started doing it since then. But yeah, you're always going to see that. Sometimes you will see problem writers or testers even jump in on there, offering some, some insights on things that they thought about while they were writing the problem or where the inspiration for the problem came from. Um, things that we knew might be possible approaches, things that we knew look like good approaches that don't work. So there, there really is a lot of interactive discussion there. And that's, again, that's one of the most fun things about about the marathon matches, in my opinion. Ooh. Okay, that's what I see a harder question coming in. Let's see. Okay, it's oh okay. Oh, I'm glad I was able to answer those those first questions. I'm gonna gonna read out Catalan's question here to make sure that I understand the question first before I try to answer it. I'm gonna just grab a sip of my drink here just to make sure that my voice doesn't totally go out while I'm trying to get through this. Is there a way to encourage more posts from top competitors by tying up the CCO points to publishing your approach? For example, you need to post at least 10 lines of approach to get two points. I think that's an interesting idea. I think trying to dig into the pros and cons of how well that might actually work or might not work probably goes beyond the scope of what we want to cover today. I do think that's, I do think that's an interesting way of thinking about things. I, I'm not convinced of how well that would actually work in practice or how valuable it might actually be. I think it's worth talking about more, though. Uh, I hope I can't give you a definite yes or no. I do think it's interesting, though. Uh, next slide. Oh, there we go. Okay. The local tester. As I was alluding to, the local tester is what produces the nice visualizations of your solutions. Some of the options it may come with uh, you have the option of testing a specific test seed or possibly multiple different seeds. You can turn the visualization on and off. Sometimes if you're just making changes to your solution offline and you want to quickly run it just to see how it scores, turning the visualization off will make it a lot faster and just kind of spit out your score, especially if you don't care how it actually looks. You can manually set in parameters in many cases. You can often save your input, output, and results out to a file so that you can evaluate them more after the fact. Uh, you can also do various things specific to the particular problem, the size of the window, how fast the animation runs, how many threads it uses, a lot of things like this. Those are going to vary a lot by the individual problem, and in some cases by the creativity and the, the whim of the person putting together the tester. Some folks just have different approaches to it or not. Something I have seen a lot of members do, this is actually very, very common if you're on site at CCO, you'll see this. A lot of folks will write on custom or have already written their own custom uh, kind of software to ingest the output from the visualizer slash tester uh, so that they can kind of automatically batch up a bunch of test runs, have it run through something else secondary that, that kind of gathers up all those scores. I've seen spreadsheets with multiple different colors showing which test cases did better or worse than the last run. A lot of cool things like this. So uh, as you get more advanced and you really get more serious about this, if you get that serious, this is something that the, the local tester allows you to do. You can you know, build on your own stuff for it. You are given the source code for the local tester also. So if you want to do, if you want to do other things with it, if you want to tweak it a little bit, 
uh, maybe to display some different debug output along the way just to get a sense of what's going on internally, uh, or even to look at it internally to get a better sense for how the test cases are being generated. All of this is available to you. Uh, the, the idea, again, is not in the obscurity of how the problem is formulated, but in, in the fact that we don't believe that there is going to be definitely a good way to solve it. So, yeah, that's all available to you to see what you want to do with it. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, the submission process. You simply need to upload a zip file containing your source code. That's a, a single source code file ending in .java, .cs, .cpp, um, or .py. Put it in a zip file, you upload it, just like you would for a for other top coder contest. When that happens, you're going to get several different emails regarding your submission. You're going to get one telling you that it was uh, submitted, and you're eventually going to get one with information about your score. Typically, there's going to be 10 example cases and 100 provisional cases. For the 10 example cases, as Dimitri was mentioning earlier, you're going to get the individual score in each case, the output that was generated by your solution, and any debug information that your solution spit out. If there was an error message or things, you'll get that also. For the 100 provisional cases, the only thing you're going to get from that is your total overall score that was computed by the end of it. And then once your score is done, the leaderboard will be updated with the results of your score. So, um, after this, and I'm sorry, after the submission deadline is done, when so everybody's submitted, no more submissions are being accepted, then every submission is run on the, the testing set or the final test set, which typically is going to be 2,000 or more test cases. Can we go to the next slide, please? So scoring. For each test case, there's going to be a raw score computed. The way that raw score is computed is going to be varying based on the problem. In some cases, it's maybe the removes that your solution took, it's the number of things that your solution captured, it's the percentage of the math that was covered, it's the total penalties you incurred, some combination of any of those things. The, the problem statement will explain how your raw score is created for each test case. And then for each test case of those 100 provisional cases, a relative score is going to be generated. That's based on, uh, that is based on essentially a percentage against the best score. If somebody matched the score 100 and scored a 55, you get a 0.55 uh, relative score for that test case. If the best score anybody got was 3 and you also got 3, you get a 1.0 for that test case. Uh, anything where you fail to return a valid output, you time out, um, or you generate an error, anything like that, then that, that particular case gets a 0. The total score of your submission is the sum of those 100 relative scores. Final testing works similarly. Your, your final score will be the sum of the uh, relative scores for each test case. And then that's, that's scaled out scaled out to a value between 0 and 100. So essentially with relative scoring, a value of 100 means you have the best score on every test case. Um, and then everything is sort of scaled off from there. If you're in the upper 90s, it means you are at or near the best for most of the test cases, for instance. Next slide. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the forums. Ostensibly, the forums are there for help with the problem. One of the things you are allowed to do is ask questions about the problem or technical issues submitting to the problem or you know maybe technical issues with downloading some of the files that are made available, any of these things. If the, something about the problem statement is unclear, and you can say, so this line says this, I'm not sure what that means. Those kind of questions are great. We want you to ask those things because we want you to understand what you're supposed to do. We want everybody to have the best chance they can to solve the problem well. You're also allowed to ask about the visualizer, especially if you're having trouble with it for some reason. Do ask, and obviously other members are free to try to help, and the people behind the problem will also try to help when they can. What you are not allowed to discuss are algorithms, methods, or solutions. Don't say, hey, do you think it would be great if I used some dynamic programming on this one? Don't say, hey, everybody, what's the best score you found for test case number five? Things like this are not okay because that really kind of spoils the spirit of the competition while it's ongoing. Um, and also, don't, don't offer um, advice on how to solve the problem. You can offer advice clarifying the problem, but not on how to solve it. Again, that is, that is important for just contest integrity. After the competition, however, as soon as submissions are no longer being accepted, 
So the world is your oyster. Talk about whatever you want. Talk about how to solve it. Talk about approaches. Anything that came up, and I think earlier I'll say again now, probably the single best way to learn about marathons. Talk to other people. See what they did. Compare it to what you did. See what works better and why. And you never know what other people may have come up with. A lot of times, even some of the best competitors will see some ideas. They're like, oh, that would have been interesting to try. I didn't think of that. And that's, that's really where you learn. Next slide, please. All right. I, I believe pretty soon we're going to be switching back over, and Dimitri's going to talk about some of this. Yeah, I think I'll talk about this bit. All okay, right. so... Thank you, Erin. That was very useful. So much information for everyone. Um, so now I'll just briefly talk about some common marathon approaches. Um, and as you realize, each problem is completely unique and different. And, you know, you've got to try a bunch of different things to find what really works. But usually, usually there's some common techniques that are worth trying that always, you know, are a good starting point and can give you a decent solution. So these are the general purpose techniques. Um, one of the ones I really like to get started with is a sort of a Monte Carlo simulation method. So you'll generate random solutions and you generate a lot of them and then you pick the one that gives you the highest score. And we're actually going to see an example of this later on when I talk about the practice problem. Okay, and then there are some similar methods that they're kind of heuristic methods. So there's hill climbing, simulated annealing, genetic algorithms. So they all are powerful and then can give you a good solution. So hill climbing is one of my favorite techniques because it's really easy to implement. You basically start with a random solution and then you make little moves, little mutations that change the solution. And then if the changes is, is good, so if it in, improves your score, you keep it, otherwise you reject it. And you keep doing this until you sort of reach a local minimum or a maximum. And at that point you could, you could sort of randomize the solution again and start over and see if you can get a, a, a better local minima or maximum. So yeah, I find that a really useful technique to start off with. A similar technique is simulated annealing. Uh, the difference is there's also a temperature parameter and the temperature sort of controls how likely you are to accept a move that reduced your score. So a move that was sort of bad. So at the start, you normally have a high temperature. So you're more likely to accept bad moves, which allows you to um, explore the, the problem space really well. And then you slowly reduce this temperature, um, which means you're becoming more greedy and you're really optimizing the score later on. Okay, so this is a very powerful technique, but personally, I struggle with it because um, I'm not very good at finding um, a good schedule for how you reduce the temperature, but other more experienced marathoners are very good at it. There's also genetic algorithms where you have a population of solutions um, and you might also have a, a crossover uh, function that takes two solutions and then merges them into a single solution. Again, this can be useful but personally, I find it um, difficult to find this crossover function. Sometimes it, it doesn't really make sense to have one. And often the genetic algorithms kind of take a longer time to converge. So remember, you only have 10 seconds per test case. So not only you need a good algorithm, but it also has to be fast. So uh, it's quite important to, yeah, to make to make it very efficient. And that, this is why I like hill climbing. Now, Beam Search is a really cool algorithm. I'm not very good at it, but some people have, have really done great things with Beam Search. Basically, the way I see it, it's a combination of a search algorithm combined with, um, with a simulation method at the end. 
So it's kind of like a breadth first search, but at each level, you only, you only pick the top K solutions. So these are the top K strongest solutions and you, and then you reuse them at the next level. Um, where K is usually called the BIM width. And you might want to have a schedule where the BIM width is, is varied as you go down the solution. Um, yeah, and again, it has a very nice property where at the start you'll be exploring the, the problem space really well. And then later on, you'd be doing a lot more optimization. And speaking of optimization, there's a, there's a lot of other sort of classic algorithms that are commonly used in SRMs that you can apply to marathon matches. Um, so you might not be able to solve every case optimally, but you could use these classic algorithms to solve smaller cases or maybe some sub problems of the problem really well, or, and then they can give you a good starting point for your other heuristic methods. So things like um, depth first search, A star search are very useful for sort of pathfinding problems. Then you have your classic dynamic programming, you know, that's, that's used all over the place in algorithms. Again, it can be useful in marathons. Integer programming is a very powerful technique. If you can, if you're able to model your problem as integer programming, um, sometimes you might even get an optimal solution. And in fact, one of the problems I, I wrote early on, uh, I think it was called points on grid. You could actually solve every case optimally, even the really large cases optimally with integer programming. But however, it turned out that, you know, integer programming can be quite inefficient. Um, there, there is a lot of code to write and, and, and get it working correctly. So you couldn't actually solve, solve things optimally in the, in the, in the given 10 seconds. So, you know, you've got to balance efficiency as well. Um, what else? So zero one knapsack, classic um, algorithm by pie type matching that can be used too. So I remember there was a, a problem about the eternity puzzle. So it's basically, you've got to put a bunch of um, different jigsaw pieces together. So they match at the edges. There was actually a, a million dollar prize for solving this puzzle. Anyway, it turns out you can, you can um, fix half of the pieces and then the remaining half you could place optimally. So you can place the, so the location is optimal and also the rotation of each piece is optimal using bipartite matching. So that can be a very powerful technique. And if you, if you incorporate it with the heuristic methods, that makes your solution a lot stronger. Okay. So, okay, so now we'll talk about a practical example. So this is a practice problem that we just launched recently. It's based on a previous problem that we did in Marathon Match 114, the Snake Charmer. So I'm just gonna talk briefly about this problem. Um, so hopefully everyone can see it. Yep. Okay. Yep. So uh, you work as a snake charmer and you want to impress the crowd with your skillful control of the snake. So the snake actually lives on an end by end grid and it, it comes out from the central square and you can control the snake. So it can move up, down, left, right at each, um, at, at each step. And then, so it does some path and then eventually you run out of moves or you hit, you hit the edge of the grid. So this is where you stop. And the idea is you, you want to maximize the score. And so the snake is divided into these sections. Each section takes a single cell and each section contains the number. So the score for a number V is V raised to M plus one. 
where M is the number of um, adjacent, adjacent sections that have the same number. So for example, the central four here scores really well because there are, there are four other adjacent cells with a four. So you'll get four to the five points, which is pretty good. The three here gets uh, three to the three points because there's two other threes adjacent to it. So adjacency is just left, right, up, down. Okay, and then so you get a score for each section and then you sum up all the sections to get your final score. So the final score here is 3,339. Okay, so, so that's your problem statement. Just gives you an idea what the problem is. And usually we provide with a sample picture just for you to get thinking about the problem. And then the next section is the actual implementation. So this usually talks about the input and output of the problem. So in this problem, the inputs are the, they're given a standard in. So on each, on each separate line, you'll receive N, the grid size. V is the number of different section values. So here V is three, which means the section values can be two, three or four. You can't have any other ones. And the snake is just a string of characters where, so each character represents um, a section value and the first character corresponds to the head of the snake and the last character is the tail. So actually in this example, the head is the three here. So that's the first character that comes out. Okay, and your, your output, on the first line, you write the number of steps that the snake has taken. So this is um, pretty standard procedure. So you normally um, write the size of your output. This is just for the tester to read. And then this is followed by S lines where each line represents a move that you make. So it's just a single character like left up, right or down. Okay, so the scoring is you know, the total value of each section summed up. But of course, there are cases where you actually get zero points. And this happens when your solution was illegal. So for example, if you used more than n squared minus one steps in your solution, or if your snake left the grid at any point or actually collided with itself, that's also illegal. And you know, anything, anything else that you do like unrecognized directions or weird characters running out of time. Remember, you only get 10 seconds per test case. So yeah, so the score you see here, this is your raw score. Now to get your normalized score, we take that and we, we actually divide it by the maximum score that anyone has achieved on this test case. So for example, if your raw score was 100 and someone got 200, then you get 0.5 of a point. If you did actually manage to get 200, then you have the best score on that test case and you get 1.0 points, which is the best you can do. And then finally, we sum up all the scores for each provisional case. So your final score would be something out of 100. Okay, the next section talks about how the, t how the cases are generated. So usually they're, they're random and the, um, the values are chosen uniformly at random. So we generate the grid size, then we generate the number of section values, and then this tells you the constraints on, on these parameters. So this kind of, this is useful to know um, because, you know, some algorithms would, might be too slow for a large test case, so you can reject them straight away. So it kind of tells you what to focus on. It also tells you the smallest test case, which is just seven. Um, and you might come up with an algorithm that can solve that particular test case optimally. Um, and then we generate this, then we actually generate the snake. 
And again, you can actually look at the tester code and see how it's done precisely. So this, this is just a short summary. Finally, we have some notes. So these are usually pretty standard. So we normally give you 10 seconds per test case. Um, the memory is 1000 megabytes. Compilation time is 30 seconds. Although I'm not actually sure that we, we check this. Um, there are 10 example test cases and 100 provisional test cases. So the difference with this match is it's just a practice match. So it's not rated. There are no final testing, but in a normal match, you, you have all those things. So language is supported. And then finally, um, we give you some, some files to download. And this is very useful to get started with. So we give you these sample submissions in each language. So you can download the source code, zip it up, submit it, and, and then you get your first solution. And we also provide you the source code for the local tester. So this is in Java. And if you don't have a Java compiler, you can you can run the the jar file, which we also provide. So it's kind of like a binary file that you can run. And finally, so we show you how to how to run your your solution. So you 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 run the the jar file, the Java jar, and then you provide the exec command. And here you have a command to run your local, your actual solution, and then the seed value. And of course, this can be followed by some other options. So you can um, turn off the visualizer, remove debugging, uh, change the, you know, the size in pixels of the grid. You can set custom parameters and all sorts of other things. So this is kind of problem dependent. But recently, WLight has done a lot of great work and he's, he's just made the, um, the local tester really useful. So now you can, you can test a whole range of seeds. So you can go test everything from 20 to 30 um, and then you can save it, you can save it to the to a file, you can save your solutions, the inputs, the outputs. It also records your best scores. So this is super useful. It means you don't have to hack your own code. Um, it just does it all for you. Yeah, it's a it's a real game changer. And finally, you can even do testing in um, in a multi-threaded environment. So that that makes your testing a lot faster. So yeah, do check it out. There's, um, there's a link here that shows you um, the documentation for that. Right. Okay, so is this, is this all clear? Have we got any, are there any questions on this? Let me have a look. Uh, uh, no questions in the chat, Dimitri. So we okay, no questions. So we can continue. Okay. So let's have a look at some actual code. Okay, so here is the example solution that you can download. So I'm just going to talk about Java because it's kind of easier for me because I use Java. But we do provide you the other three languages as well. Okay, so this is the main function. We create a buffer reader, so it reads um, the system input stream. Um, we read the parameters, the size of the grid, the number of section values and the actual snake. And then here we run our program. So we create the program instance and we run it with these parameters. And then we output the result of our program. So that's, that's the length of the solution and then the, the actual moves that the snake has taken. So in this particular example, it's very basic. We just um, create a, um, a spiral. So it just goes left, down, right, up, and then keeps repeating itself. So very boring, but it gives us a solution. So let's have a look at that. Okay. 
Oh, actually, I will just compile everything first. So let's compile the, um, the tester. So that will compile the tester and all the associated files. And let's compile the actual example solution. Okay. And then um, I will just run, I will just run the, um, the example solution on seed one and I provide size zero means just expand the window to full screen. So as I explained, um, I'm just writing the binary, the binary file. So I don't actually need to compile the, the local tester. I provide the execution command. So this here, it's Java snake charmer. For Python, it would be something like Python snake charmer.py um, and so on. So let's run this. Okay, so we have a solution. Um, as you can see, it's just a spiral, right? And actually the visualization is very nice. So thank you W Light again for making this quite pretty. It actually looks like a snake now. Okay, so it tells you the final score, 1,179. It tells you the time that your solution took. Obviously it was pretty fast because there was no computation. And it also tells you the count for each, um, you know, for each value type. So we didn't get any reds, so we, we get zero. We got one yellow. So this four has three adjacent fours and so on. Okay. And then of course we can run this for a, for a bigger seed. So usually the first seed is the smallest seed as just done for testing. And then the second seed is the largest seed. So it has the largest grid size 49 here and the most number of values. So yeah, again, this is a spiral and we actually got a bit lucky because we we got a um, we got a red we got a red here, so we get some good points. So total score one hundred twenty seven thousand. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is just try something a little bit more complicated. It's not particularly smart, but it's perhaps a bit more interesting. So the first method I'm going to show you is just the um, the Monte Carlo simulation method. I call it solve random. And what it does is at each iteration, it generates a completely random walk of the snake. And then it scores this random walk. And I'll show you how it does that. And if the score is better than whatever we've seen before, we, we store that solution and then we just print it just for our own purposes. So if you want to do that kind of printing, you can use um, system.err uh, and that way go into the local tester. And so we run this until we run out of time. So I here I actually check that we're still under the time limit. So max time, I usually set to nine, nine and a half seconds just to make sure I'm on under the 10 seconds. Um, yeah, so random walk is pretty basic. We have the, the, the possible directions and then we shuffle them at each step. And as soon as we find a valid direction, then we take that a move in that direction. Otherwise we, we keep looking for another direction. And if we didn't find any direction to move, then we stop. So this is where we run out of moves. Um, and then there's a, there's a scoring function. So the scoring function, you can either write it yourself, but I actually find it easier if you, if you take it from the, um, from the tester, because the tester also has a scoring function and it's written in Java. So you might as well just grab it and use it. Although make sure sometimes it's not very well optimized. So it 
could be very slow, so you might have to do a bit of work to make it faster. Um, anyway, the scoring function here is we take our solution, so these are the steps, we simulate the snake, um, we store the results in a grid, and then we actually compute the score for each value in the grid. So you're, you're counting the number of neighbors, and then we'd, we're doing them um, raising to the power of matches plus one. Okay, so that's pretty basic. Let us compile that. And I'll, I'm going to run it on the first seed. Okay, so we've got a solution and it's scoring pretty well. Okay, it's, it's got 3000 points. Um, there's a few reds and And actually, it, it did 380,000 iterations. So that number of random walks, and then it picked the best one. So that's not bad. And you think, oh, okay, this is a great solution. But then we run it on C2. And suddenly, we realize that this approach we're taking is not so great. And this is because a lot of random walks that you make, they actually um, run into themselves or run into a corner and then they can't escape. And so you, you don't end up using a lot, all the cells available and you get a low score. So we actually got a score lower than our spiral. So that's not very good. So now we've got to think, okay, how can we modify this solution to make it better? And one way we can do this, so I call this solve random two. I'm just gonna activate it. So solve random two is very similar to the first one. It produces random walks and then it keeps walks that, are, that have the highest score except this time we actually reused the best solution that we found so far. So in particular, we, we pick our best solution and, and we fix the first number, some first number of steps. So this, um, this variable fixed steps is the number of steps, initial steps that we want to fix. And then the remaining steps we actually do randomly. So this way we actually, we're not wasting CPU cycles, we're actually reusing our previous solution. So that's kind of useful. Um, and one other modification is the, in the random walk, we don't, we don't choose a, we don't shuffle the directions randomly at each step. Instead, we just shuffle them once right at the start. And after that, the order is fixed. So these two changes are the only changes that we're going to make. We're going to recompile it. And let's run it again on C2. And hopefully we'll get something better this time. Okay, so yeah, so you can see we, we've actually haven't covered all the cells, but despite that, we, we're getting a much higher score. So now we're getting 300,000, which is pretty good. And you can see, so it kind of starts off going in one direction and then eventually it, it fixes those steps and then tries a different ordering of directions. So that's that's where you get these sudden turns and then it does that again somewhere and then back here. So it's actually a combination of multiple random walks. And yeah, it turns out to do a lot better. So we actually got five 
five red cells, which is pretty good. I'll just show you one more example. If we run it on a slightly smaller grid, Okay, yeah, so you can see it's actually doing quite well. It's getting a lot of red cells, which is good. So yeah, that score is pretty good. Anyway, if we, if we actually want to submit the solution, we go to submit and then we, we zip up our source code and then we just upload it here drag it in, drop it, and then we tick the box here that you agree with the terms and conditions and then you click submit. And then once you submit, you will actually, um, you know, you'll get the emails and then eventually once your solution is judged, you get some score on the leaderboard and then you can see how, how you're doing on the leaderboard. And actually, if you were going to submit the example solution, you would score 25 points. But then with the, with the new random walk solution, you're going to get 44 points, which is, you know, still, still far from, from optimal, but it's, it's better than the example solution. So it's something to get you started. Okay. So that pretty much covers the the coding section and I'm just going to leave this slide here so we have some helpful resources for, for you to use. So there's, there's various uh, user guides written by different members. There's also um, a user guide written in Japanese. I know we have a lot of Japanese coders so that would be useful. We also have an old marathon matches tutorial. Um, some of it doesn't apply anymore, but there's still some really good ideas there. So worth reading. There's the local tester documentation. And finally, there's a link to the to the practice problem for you to try out. So yeah, um, I hope I hope this was useful to everyone. And I'm looking forward to seeing you competing in marathon matches. And um, yeah, it's, it's a really fun competition. So do give it a go. You won't regret it. It's yeah, really good. And please let us know if you have any questions. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll probably hang around here for a minute or two uh, just to see if anybody comes in with any additional questions that we haven't already covered. Oh, look at that. Your, your walkthrough was appreciated. It was very well done. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. So... Uh, we, yep, you see the incoming question too, don't you? <laughs> oh, hang on. Chad is here. Yep. Is question, yes. So the question is, when to use simulated annealing versus beam search? How do I identify the pattern? Um, I would say do a lot of problems and you'll get good at it over time. I don't want to try to give advice on that because, frankly, I was never all that great at doing marathons. I understand how to write interesting problems. Um, I understand conceptually about how to solve them. I'm not that great at actually doing the solutions myself. But what I what I would suggest, though, is look at instances where you've used that before and, and see if things look similar. The other thing, too, with marathon matches where you've got such a long time, seven days is a relatively long time anyway, when we're you know dealing with things that operate in nanoseconds, um, that's a that's a long time to really try a bunch of different things. You could try just a basic solution in any of those things, and you can often very quickly get a sense if an approach that you're on might be fruitful or not, or it's just a terrible idea. You can oftentimes figure that out pretty easily and and pretty quickly when you try it. Again, though, really, there's no better way to know that than just experience and. In addition to experience your own familiarity with each approach and how well you're able to apply that up to the problem um, is oftentimes a bigger indicator than just necessarily picking algorithm du jour off the shelf to use it for a given problem. You kind of have to take it problem by problem. A lot of times 
things may seem like one type of approach is going to work, but you may find that it's really nothing like that. Yeah, can I jump in here? Um, if you're able to implement both algorithms well, like if you've done it before, then I would actually implement both of them and then see which one is better because you really don't know until you try it out. You know, every problem is different and it's, it's really about experimenting and finding ways to, to make a better solution. So yeah, do try them both out. But in the beginning, you'd probably want to try something simpler, like a random like a random solution um, and then incrementally make it better and better and just see what works. Hopefully that answered your question, Charlene. We answered that with kind of a non-answer, I realize. That's yeah, sometimes it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Is the question now? Yeah. Okay, so the question is sometimes there's a lot of substates, for example, in Marathon 17, uh, the slum state, we have to explore all of them how to choose. I'm going to give you the same non answer for this one. It's experience. Um, <laughs> initially, start off just choosing randomly and, and seeing what works. As you do a bit of refining of a random solution, though, especially if you're looking in the visualizer or you're kind of following your debug output, that kind of thing, you often will get into various patterns and things that things that clearly are working better than others. This is where the visual, visualization can be really helpful. And, and it does require some amount of experience and skill on the part of the competitor to know what to look for, of course. Basic idea, though, is you yield certain things with certain certain solutions you'll see where are the areas that your solution is failing. If you take a little bit of time, especially on test cases that you know you're not doing well on, ask yourself, why is my solution doing so terribly on this case? Is it because it's not designed to handle something larger? Is it because it's getting stuck searching for something too small? Is it, is it spending too long on something that doesn't matter? Uh, could be any of those things. Could be something totally different. Let's get some ideas. But really, a little bit of that, that guess and check and looking at your detailed output it's probably going to tell you a lot more than any kind of generic advice we could come up with right now. Yeah, so usually in in problems with a large search space, you might be able to, to reduce the search space so some of it is not very relevant to a solution and just focus on the part that is relevant and just solve that really well. Um, you might want to try using some symmetries or some different um, scoring functions. You could even use scoring functions different to the what the problem is asking. So that could help you. Actually, in that particular problem, um, I remember you could you could swap any two adjacent cells in five moves. So at most five moves, you can swap any two adjacent cells. And that means you can bring any cell, by, by doing the, uh, a sequence of these swaps, you can bring any cell to its target location. So that, that already gives you a pretty good starting solution. Something else to keep in mind too, um, the um, details about the test case generation will often tell you certain things kind of bounding the size limits, bounding the parameters a bit. And in some cases, the way the test cases themselves are generated will give you some very good hints about sort of subcases that you might be likely to find and things that you're not going to be likely to find in actual test cases. If you spend a little bit of time thinking through some of that, sometimes you can get some, get some little hints from that about what kind of thing you want to optimize for versus which ones you might not want to be looking at. Again, experience is going to pay more value than than any specific piece of advice. You, you really want to do look into everything that's made available to you, though. Yeah, and also, you know, um, use Google. Look for, read about these articles, uh, sorry, about these algorithms in, in 
Wikipedia, in other articles, read research papers, talk to other people, obviously after the competition, and learn how they approach the problem and then try those methods on the new problem and yeah, see how you go. It's, it's all about the learning experience and practice makes perfect. So the best way to learn and get better at this is to sign up for the next marathon, participate in it, and then talk with people afterwards. And then do the same to the one after that, and the one after that, and so on. That's right. And the next one is coming up in about a month. So that's pretty soon. So get ready, and it will be a great problem. So you will love it. And also, while you're solving the problem, you'll be earning points to go to the next TCO. So that's actually a good opportunity to go to the on-site competition and actually meet meet these people in, in person and learn from them. Yep, that's definitely a great suggestion there too. Yeah. All right, and you all just want to try to throw a question at us, challenge us a bit? All right, that's probably where we'll wrap it up then, I guess. I think, yeah. I, I know, um, speaking for myself, I imagine I probably speak for all of us on this side. Uh, we appreciate everybody joining us. Uh, I certainly some fun talking about this stuff and presenting it. Uh, Dimitri, thanks so much for all of your help putting together the presentation and kind of outlining all this. And of course, wonderful job by you discussing through some of the elements of marathons and some examples of how to actually approach one. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks for your, all your great work. And everyone, thank you for joining us. I hope it was useful. <laughs>